Hello, this is the video version of my Pilot Briefing podcast, hence why I'm here in the studio and why I'm not flying as usual. I know many of you prefer to watch the Pilot Briefings here on YouTube, so I'll be keeping those going. But being a podcast, there will be some short interludes of music in between some of the stories. I hope you won't find that too distracting. So let's jump into it and join our podcast listeners. Roll the intro music. Hello and welcome to the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing Podcast. Today we hear what caused a large drone looking for migrants in the English Channel to lose all communication with its remote pilot, the second serious technical incident involving that exact aircraft in just over two years. There's another consultation on cost-sharing flights in the UK. Are you keeping up with it all? I'll explain what the CAA is up to now. And 121.5, the internationally recognised emergency frequency. There's a new policy document stating how the UK sees this service being provided here. The Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing is sponsored by AOPA UK, the leading membership association for pilots, aircraft owners and general aviation businesses. The Pilot Briefing is also made in association with Astral Aviation Consulting. Astral is the CAA safety partner, producing safety-related general aviation content for private pilots. Check out their website for free tutorials, workshops and other safety resources. So an air accident investigation report caught my eye this week. Um, I nearly missed it, actually, and it seems others have probably missed it as well because I haven't seen anyone reporting about it anywhere. It concerns the loss of communication with a very large drone operating beyond visual line of sight in southern England. And if you wondered why we have those temporary danger areas in the English Channel, this will enlighten you. It certainly did me. The report concerns a serious incident involving the Tekeva AR5 Evolution Mark II UAV, registration Golf Tango Echo Kilo Victor. This is the twin-engine drone contracted by the Home Office and Border Force to search for migrant boats in the English Channel. In January this year, it had been operating over the sea in danger area Delta 098 when it encountered a complete loss of communication with its base. Danger area Delta 098 is a complex of danger areas that operate between the Kent coastline and the midpoint of the English Channel. The drone, weighing as much as a fairly large sports motorbike, 180 kilograms at full weight, with a wingspan of more than 7 metres, took off at 5.38 in the morning on the 17th of January. The report doesn't state this, but I understand that the drone operates from LID. It was being controlled from a ground control station where a crew controlled the aircraft remotely. It was using SATCOM, or I suppose satellite communications, as its primary command and control link, with a SATCOM backup on standby. At 1.36 in the afternoon, after more than eight hours of flight, the primary SATCOM link suddenly dropped out with no warning. The aircraft activated then its return to home flight mode. And we have these on these consumer drones, don't we? If it loses the link, it will do a planned manoeuvre. And in this case, uh, the drone was programmed to follow a predefined lost link route, remaining wholly within the temporary danger area. Now, the drone is programmed to initially remain in a holding pattern there before returning to a safe location if communication isn't re-established. And once at that safe location, within radio link range, it's then able to land safely. Now, the drone was operating completely autonomously during the course, uh, course, course of this failure for two minutes with no link at all to its pilot. And then the backup channel kicked in and the command and control of the aircraft was regained again. However, this backup link isn't as good as the primary link. It isn't able to transmit data such as telemetry and video. 
The remote pilot then flew the aircraft closer to its home station, presumably LID, to re-establish that radio link, that radio line of sight communication with the drone. And this would have involved the drone flying to within three kilometres of its base station, the range of that radio link. Eventually, this radio link was connected along with 4G. And then at 2.16 in the afternoon, the primary SATCOM link came back online. The flight then resumed, continued as originally planned, with the aircraft finally landing at 3.21 in the afternoon. Of course, an investigation into this problem began. The case was reported to the Air Accident Investigation Branch and ground testing of the drone's SATCOM terminal began and they found some faults with it. They found that replacing the SATCOM antenna did the trick and the drone was then returned to flight. The good news is that the Air Accident Investigation Branch says that the drone behaved exactly as anticipated during the loss of communication in compliance with its operational authorization. They will have had a risk assessment uh, which would have uh, covered the loss of communications, primary communications and what it should do. And it did exactly what the risk assessment said it should do. But how is the operator going to prevent this from happening again? It's not good, is it? The AAIB says that the operator has indicated that all future variants of the drone will now be equipped with a feature that automatically enables the SATCOM backup to come online when fewer than two command links are available. So presumably the backup will be ready to take over without delay. Now, this isn't the first serious incident involving Golf Kilo Victor. Just over two years earlier, it had been orbiting south of Lid Airport at 600 feet in preparation for landing when the aircraft did not leave the orbit as commanded. And then without warning, both of its engines shut down unexpectedly in flight. Now, the external remote pilot who was visual with the aircraft as it had just descended below the cloud base was able to take control using their remote control unit and land the plane successfully on the runway corrupted data on one of the communication channels was found to be the cause of this other serious incident. And it turns out that a similar problem had been found on a model of the drone in Portugal six months earlier. And a firmware update had been issued to solve part, partly solve this problem. But it turns out that the firmware hadn't been uploaded loaded to Golf Kilo Victor. Now, the air accident report into the engine shutdown case states that the firmware has now been updated and the design of a radio command channel has been changed. So a couple of interesting cases. And I suppose for us pilots, I was going to say manned pilots, I don't know if that's the term we use these days. Um, for, for us pilots and our passengers, it does show that there's perhaps a little way still to go before we can safely share the airspace with uncrewed aircraft. And I've been sceptical about the need for that huge swathe of temporary danger areas in the English Channel. I guess we all now know and understand why they need to be there. Coming up, another consultation on cost-sharing flights. What is the UK CAA up to on this topic now? But first, please allow me to thank AOPA UK for sponsoring the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing. AOPA keeps on top of the regulatory proposals and other changes and issues affecting general aviation. I think it's really important that we have strong representative organisations like AOPA because without them, who would be holding the regulators and governments to account and standing up for our rights and freedoms as aviators? Personally, I don't have much time to read through all these documents and respond uh, like the one we're going to be hearing about today about cost sharing. But AOPA is there to read them all and to speak on my behalf. They're also there should I get into any bother and need some advice. Flying Reporter followers can benefit from a very generous 25% discount on new AOPA UK one-year and two-year memberships. The link to that offer is in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast. The video description if you're watching this on YouTube. And it also can be accessed through the Flying Reporter website. Go and check out the offer today. So cost sharing. And for years now, there's been talk of the UK strengthening the rules. I suspect that you, like me, have lost track a bit of where things stand and what's going on. 
There's been an update in the last few days, which I'm going to come on to in a second. But first, a quick recap if you've fallen behind. So if you didn't know, cost sharing is where pilots on private flights can carry passengers and where all on board can share the cost of the flight between them legally, so long as the pilot doesn't profit. It's been happening for a long time. Initially in the UK, the advertising of such flights uh, was prohibited, say, for example, on websites and social media. Uh, back then, flights had to be promoted or uh, advertised, for want of a better term, on the notice boards of flying clubs and so on. And that was permitted back then. We were then regulated by EASA and advertising was permitted. And this led to the growth of cost sharing websites like Wingly, for example, who run a business providing a service, putting potential passengers in touch with pilots. It's a hugely contentious issue. You know, some airports ban it. I know pilot friends of mine who have polarised views on the subject. And some, particularly commercial pilots and commercial operators, have complained that the relaxation of the cost sharing rules has opened up the potential for illegal flights and grey charters to take place. Some feel that private pilots are bending the rules or operating flights that are in effect commercial air transport for which they're not suitably qualified and their aircraft not adequately maintained, insured and operated. Now, there wasn't an awful lot being done about this until January 2019. That year, there was a horrible fatal crash in the English Channel at night involving the footballer Emiliano Sala. Both Mr. Sala and the pilot died in that crash. The pilot, it turned out, didn't have a commercial pilot's licence, nor the correct qualifications for flying at night on the day in flight in question. And the man who organised the flight was sentenced to 18 months in prison. The year after that fatal crash, the UK left the European Union and EASA. And then a year after that, the UK CAA set up a working group to review the cost sharing rules as a result of that crash, I suspect, to see if there were any areas where safety could be improved and risk reduced. This led to a public consultation in December 2021. Following that whole process, it looked as if the CAA was proposing the following changes. Firstly, it would introduce regulation so that passenger declaration forms will become mandatory and pilots will have to keep them for six months. They proposed a new rule stating that pilots and passengers must pay an equal share of the direct cost of the flight. At the moment, the pilot must pay something in the UK, but it doesn't have to be an equal amount. They could pay a pound, 50p if they wanted. They would still be legal in future. The pilot would have to pay an equal share. Now, a third proposed rule change concerned advertising and the tightening up of the rules around that. But the problem for the CAA was that it hadn't actually consulted on changing the advertising rules. It had only decided to do that on the basis of some of the comments from respondents during its initial consultation. Some people had stated during that consultation that uh, things like advertising was a problem and told the CAA that Advertising should be banned. Cost-sharing sites should be banned. Private pilots were operating cost-sharing flights dangerously even, they said, in bad weather and so on. Off the back of those comments, the CAA decided on a new proposal which would make it illegal to advertise a flight where the passenger or passengers are able to dictate the destination, date or time of the flight or flights. It also was considering requiring pilots to state their experience and medical status in any advertising posted. So that brings us bang up to date. I hope you're keeping up. <laughs> so now they've had to put out a new consultation because they want to change the advertising rules, you see. And uh, what they're proposing to do is to allow cost sharing flights to be advertised, but the flight will have to be placed by the pilot intending to operate the flight, the advert that is, and it must relate to a specific flight that the pilot intends to make, regardless of whether passengers are available for carriage or not. The advertisement must include the start and end locations, as well as the dates when the pilot intends to conduct the flight. In other words, a pilot won't be able to hold themselves out, is the technical term. They won't be able to advertise that they're available to take passengers anywhere, any day, any time. It must be a flight that the pilot is already planning to conduct. 
Following the release of this new consultation, the cost-sharing platform Wingly has accused the CAA of being biased against cost-sharing sites and says that the regulator's proposed rules will prevent UK pilots from using their site legally. Michael MacDonald from the CAA said in a statement that it is committed to striking the right balance between protecting the public and allowing pilots to reap the benefits of sharing flight costs. He adds that these new measures are vital. The new consultation is open now until the end of November 2023. That's just three weeks ago, three weeks away from when I'm recording it. And the CAA wants the new rules in effect from autumn 2024. If you want to respond to the consultation, search the internet for CAP 2601. So for our final item on today's briefing, and a quick word about the emergency frequency 121.5. It's the internationally recognised emergency channel for aviation. If, If there's one frequency you need to remember, it's that one. And the UK operates 121.5 a little bit differently from other countries. The UK CAA has recently published uh, an updated policy statement on the frequency. And I suspect this results from recommendations made in an air accident investigation report finding into a fatal accident in Dunkerswell uh, just over two years ago. So what's different about the operation of 121.5 in the UK compared with other places in the world? Unlike most other places, the emergencies channel is not routinely monitored at civil aerodromes in the UK. Instead, it is guarded by the Distress and Diversion Cell, D&D, and that is an RAF unit based at the NATS National Air Traffic Service's Swanwick Area Control Centre, and it's got military controllers uh, listening to that frequency and monitoring. The CAA thinks it's better to have a system like that uh, because it offers a more efficient response to emergency calls. The frequency is still monitored at some international aerodromes where the distress and diversion cell is unable to hear calls made at circuit altitude. Another difference is that in the UK, pilots are encouraged to use the frequency to make practice pan calls. And this is quite unusual because in other parts of the world, The frequency is only to be used in a genuine emergency and some pilots coming over here and hearing practice pans think it's it's an abuse of the system. Now, D&D, distress and diversion, can provide instantaneous auto-triangulation of aircraft transmitting on the channel in the UK, but only above certain levels. In the London FIR, it works above 3,000 feet over land east of Wales and south of Manchester and above 2,000 feet within 40 miles of Heathrow. In the Scottish FIR, the triangulation service is provided above 8,500 feet above sea level, reducing to between 2,000 and 5,000 feet over the sea and the lowland levels. This triangulation using direction finding technology is accurate to an error of plus or minus three nautical miles. Not a lot of people would know that. Below these levels in the FIR, and for more accurate position fixing, radar identification will need to be used. In other words, they'll be asking you to squawk a particular squawk on your transponder. So if you haven't practiced making an urgency call for a while and want to know what it involves, do give D&D a call. They welcome practice pans and training fixes to help with controller training. So that wraps up this month's Pilot Briefing podcast. My thanks to AOPA UK for sponsoring the briefing. Thanks too to Astral Aviation Consulting for being my advisors on the project. Check out the Astral Aviation Consulting website for further safety resources. And if you haven't followed the podcast or subscribed to the YouTube channel, then please do so now. I'm glad I got through the podcast. I've been suffering from a bit of of cold. I hope you haven't noticed and it hasn't affected your enjoyment. I'm going to go and take a big swig of water now and I'll be back next month for another episode. Until then, take care, my friends. Fly safely, my friends. Bye for now. Mm